Here we are, the play-in tournament, the Kings the 9 seed, the Warriors the 10 seed, Kings have to win two games in a row to make the playoffs. And right now, I don't want to talk about how the Kings got here. I don't want to talk about, you know, is it, how disappointing is it, or where do they go from here, or anything. Like, we'll have plenty of time to talk about that once the season is fully over, because it will be better once we actually know when the Kings season officially ends. And so there will be plenty of time to talk about whether, you know, the overall season was a success, if they have the excuses for, you know, not making top six or whatever. But right now, I'm focused on this 9-10 play-in game because this is still a very big opportunity for the Kings to be able to make the playoffs. Obviously, it would have been nice to be in that 7-8 game. Pels couldn't help us out, and we also couldn't help ourselves out. But again, that's not what happened. So here we are in the 9-10 play-in game. Against the Warriors again, another do-or-die, you know, winner-take-all game in Sacramento. We have our chance at revenge here. And so what went wrong last time, right? What went wrong game seven of the first round last year? Well, Steph Curry went for 50. But I said it then, I'll say it again now. That's not really why the Warriors won. Like, sure, he was playing well in the first half, but the Kings were right there with the Warriors. So it was about other things that happened in the second half. Like, the Warriors kind of broke the Kings in that third quarter. And then Steph just padded his stats near the end. Like, he was good, and he was a reason, a reason why they won the game. But I would argue, not the biggest reason why they won that game. And so I'm more focused on the other reasons. Because I do think the Kings are better equipped to guard Steph this year than they were last year. And they are a better defensive team. But at the end of the day, Steph, he might just get his. Right? He's that kind of player. And you can still beat the Warriors, even if he is getting his. And so the... The biggest other reason that the Warriors won in Game 7 last year, and a reason that the Warriors just have been really good for the past decade, is offensive rebounding. The Kings, in that third quarter of Game 7, could not get a defensive rebound to save their lives. Now, Kevon Looney is not the same Kevon Looney that he was last year, and so that should help the Kings out, but still, the Warriors play the same way. They shoot a lot of threes. And that, in turn, gets them a lot of offensive rebounds. They have Trace Jackson Davis, who's now slotting in there, trying to get in there and get offensive rebounds like Kevon Looney did. And the Warriors are a team that thrives on these big momentum runs. And so I think there are a few things that the Kings need to do to be able to stop those runs. And, and one of them, obviously, like I said, defensive rebounding, because offensive rebounds are so key at getting better looks from three and they're super demoralizing to the team that's giving them up. We saw just today against the Portland Trailblazers, the Trailblazers shot a million threes early on in the game and missed almost all of them. They went one for 19 in the first quarter. They got 23 offensive rebounds against the Kings. And so you can't just leave Sabonis alone. We've seen that. The Kings are a good defensive rebounding team, but at times we see Sabonis kind of get left alone trying to rebound, and that's not going to work. We need everyone rebounding, especially looking at Keegan Murray. He needs to be very good on the glass. And that kind of also leads into my next point, which is I think a key to this game is you can't be afraid to pull Harrison Barnes out of the game. Last time the Kings played the Warriors, Harrison Barnes had a career high in points. And so great, if he's playing like that, awesome. You leave him in, he can play 40 minutes. But we've seen he can also go the complete other way. And I think we have seen towards the end of the regular season, Mike Brown being quicker and quicker to pull Harrison Barnes out of the game and just not put him back in. And we saw it in the playoffs at times last year where Kevin Herter and Harrison Barnes played very limited minutes. And I just hope that Mike Brown and the coaching staff, if things aren't going well, if he's not providing offensively, then what is he doing out there? Because he's not the best rebounder. He's not the best defender. He's not good at chasing around screens. So he's just a bad matchup, especially against the Warriors defensively. And so if he's not giving you something offensively, I hope that they realize it 
and get him out of the game. And so I think that also plays into trying to stop these big runs by the Warriors of not letting runs get out of hand by making adjustments quickly. And I also want to see Mike Brown not be afraid to use his timeouts. We just saw the Kings play a game against the Pelicans where they started out the game getting blown out. Mike Brown was using his timeouts so quickly. And I loved that because there's no time to play around. This is a do or die game. If you go into the end of the fourth quarter with zero timeouts, if that's what needs to happen, then so be it. If, if it means that you're still in the game. And so I want them to not be afraid to use timeouts. And it should be interesting to see what the Kings do with the rotation. Because obviously you have your starting five. Winning this game without Malik Monk and Kevin Herter, especially Malik Monk, is going to be difficult, but the Kings can definitely do it. Harrison Barnes, if he gets going, that's a big plus, but we've seen him be very up and down. Keon Ellis has been good offensively and has been a surprise, so that's kind of a bonus, but obviously we need Keegan Murray to be aggressive offensively. I want to see Sabonis not forcing too many dribbles inside, but when he has the open jump shot to take it, because I just think what we've seen with this Kings team is they're much better without Malik Monk. They're much better in the first halves offensively than the second halves. That's how it's been. It's always been a collapse offensively in the second half, especially in clutch time. The offense just doesn't flow as much. And so we need guys to be able to step up when the offense isn't flowing and to continue to attack the basket. And I think Keegan Murray and Harrison Barnes, but uh, with Harrison Barnes, I think it's a little more either he is attacking and you're playing him or he's not and he's out of the game. With Keegan, he's going to be in the game no matter what. So we need him to come out aggressive and to be making an impact offensively whether his shot is going down or not. Because the Kings right now aren't the deepest team with Malik Monk and Kevin Herter out when it comes to the offensive side of the ball. So you look at the bench. Who are the Kings going to be bringing off the bench? It's going to be Davion Mitchell, who has been very good offensively. I tweeted out, my prediction is he's going five for six from three against the Warriors. That That's, you know, it's out there. Five for six is a lot. But my point is, I, I feel like I feel like he's going to step up from the three-point line. And he has been automatic from the three-point line lately. He's been doing a good job attacking. And so we really need him to continue to do that because this team really needs players that are going to try to create something and create their own shot, create shots for others. And so Davion stepping up in that role is huge. But then who else is off the bench? We have Trey Lyles, Alex Len. Trey Lyles is going to play a lot of minutes. Davion's going to play a lot of minutes, especially like Keon Ellis is going to get the Steph Curry assignment. But he's been struggling with foul trouble. So if he gets into foul trouble early, Davion is going to play a lot, a lot of minutes. I think he'll play a lot of minutes no matter what. Now, Steph isn't exactly Shea, Gilgis Alexander, or Luka Doncic when it comes to drawing fouls. But still, Keon's been having trouble. And so then it's interesting. If he gets into foul trouble, or if Harrison Barnes, like I said, isn't playing well, and you pull him, well, then where are the minutes going? Do you just load up on all your other all your starters because it's a do-or-die game, like all your starters plus Trey Lyles plus Davion Mitchell? Do you just load up on them? Or do you go a little deeper? Because Alex Len, I think he'll be fine to play eight minutes maybe. Maybe the Kings will go small, but I just don't really see that happening because if they go small, then you're playing a seven-man rotation and then it's like, are you playing Chris Duarte, Kessler Edwards, Sasha Vizenkov? I don't really think so. Not in a do or die game. They just haven't been good enough, haven't been consistent enough. But if somebody gets into foul trouble, if someone can't play, if Alex Len, you know, is being forced under the perimeter and you want to take him out and you need someone else, if you need someone past the eight that I've mentioned, who are you going to go to? Because... Last season, we had Terrence Davis coming off the bench, sometimes playing, sometimes not. And then in the last two games of the series, he guarded Steph Curry for some reason, which I thought was stupid. But anyways, he was the guy that stepped up. And so who would it be? Chris Duarte? No, thank you. He's too volatile, 
especially against a team like the Warriors. He fouls three-point shooters. Against the Warriors, no, no, no. I, I don't want Chris Duarte out there. So then Kessler Edwards, Sasha Vazenkov. Sasha is the most likely, but the problem is you're sacrificing defense there. You're sacrificing athleticism there. The Kings already struggled to match up against both Wiggins and Kaminga. We're going to need a good defensive game from Keegan guarding both Wiggins and Kaminga. He's going to be big. He needs to be good defensively, especially in transition. Keegan sometimes can get lost in where to match up, and we need him to be locked in in that department. But then if we do go with Sasha, like Sasha is the best player out of those, but is he the best fit? I'm not so sure. I think it is possible that we see some Kessler Edwards minutes if need be. Him going out there, just playing defense, passing the ball, taking open shots, and doing nothing else. But I really do think the coaching staff is going to do everything in their power to just limit it to an eight-man rotation and not have to go that deep into the bench because they just haven't gotten the consistency that they need out of those guys. You know, I think with Sasha, he just had a rough season, like trying to settle in. He was finally settling in, got injured, came back towards the end of the season and just, you know, didn't really have a chance to get settled in. So this season, I don't, I just don't think it's the season for him to be playing in a do or die game. So of course, we're just going to see the top guys getting a lot of minutes. I mentioned it a little earlier, but I do think the Kings are better equipped to guard Steph Curry now. And just, I mean, they're a better defensive team than they were last year but especially when you add in Keon Ellis. Keon Ellis is going to be the guy that takes the primary matchup, obviously. I thought Davion did a pretty good job in the playoffs last year. I don't know why he got moved off of him, Steph Curry. For Terrence Davis, I never liked that, but I think you'll see Keon out there a lot, and then I think the Kings just need to throw different looks at him. So you'll see Davion out there, and of course Fox can switch onto him. Earlier this season, we saw Keegan getting the assignment and doing a really good job. Now, I definitely don't want that to be the primary assignment, and we need Keegan to be able to guard the athletic wings of the Warriors, but I think the Kings are more versatile now. I think you'll see a lot of three-guard lineups out there, that being Fox, Keon, and Davion out there at the same time. I think we will see that in this game, putting those guys out there to try to chase around the perimeter. Those are our best guys when it comes to closing out on shooters. And so then it's going to come down to Domas and Keegan rebounding inside with help from guards. We've seen Keon have big rebounding performances, so I think he can obviously contribute in that way as well. Offensively, the Kings have to be able to limit turnovers. And so you can't have Sabonis trying to take a lot of dribbles down low, especially against Draybon Green. He has to be a one, maybe two dribbles, if he has the space, then make a decision with it or just playing as a role man. He needs to be confident in taking his jump shot. And really, we just need our best players to step up offensively because last season in the playoffs, we had our big players step up offensively, and that was Fox and Monk. And so now Monk's not there. You also don't have Herder. Where's the offense going to come from? It has to be Fox, Domas, and Keegan getting the majority of the shot attempts. I don't want to see the first three minutes of the game, and I don't think this will happen, but I don't want to see the first three minutes of the game where Fox barely touches the ball. We've seen that many times this season. He just chills off ball for the first three minutes. I just, I don't want to see that happen. I want to see the tone set immediately. I want to see him getting downhill. He doesn't have to be finishing every play, but I want to see him on the ball at some point on those early possessions. The clutch time offense terrifies me. The The fourth quarter offense terrifies me. This team has not looked good without Malik Monk in those situations. They haven't looked good when they're put under more pressure, you know, in the second half of games offensively. I do have faith in this team's defense to keep them in the game, which is a wild thing to say. And it's something that I have never said about a Kings team in my lifetime. This is the best the Kings have been defensively in you know, in my life that I can remember, I think, at least second best, if not best. The last thing I want to say from like an offensive perspective is in transition, 
just push the ball to the rim. Push the ball to the rim. Good things will happen. And this team has been pretty poor in doing that this season. When the Kings are in a man advantage situation in transition, I am more scared than when they're, you know, have less players because they turn the ball over so much in transition and it leads to other teams who, you know, they don't have the players down the court. They're all back still at their own offensive end. So then you turn it over as two points for the other team or three. We can't make those mistakes. Turning the ball over in transition and and having those big swings, 4.5 point swings. If there's nothing there, there's nothing there. Then back it out. But I think that's another one of those momentum plays. And the momentum plays are the plays that I'm really worried about. So your offensive rebounds, your turnovers, and especially turnovers in transition, those type of plays. A couple more things about the defensive side of the ball. The Kings have had trouble defending both Jonathan Kaminga and Andrew Wiggins. They've had trouble with those athletic wings. So that's why I said Keegan Murray is going to be super important on the defensive side of the ball. And also another reason why you have to have a short string with Harrison Barnes because he can get exploited by athletic wings. And I would much rather, you know, Trey Lyles defensively, he's better, but in terms of guarding on the perimeter, not much better. But he does add more things defensively than Harrison Barnes does. But also, I think you can go with more guard heavy lineups, like I said. And we've seen... When the guards are out there pressuring the ball, setting the tone, you know, it starts with Fox, but Keon and Davion out there as well, pressuring the ball, Keegan getting in the passing lanes. That's when the Kings are at their best. So I lo I'm looking for Fox to set the tone defensively. He normally does, so I don't see why he wouldn't in this game. And I'm just ready for the Kings to get revenge for the playoffs last year. And while it's going to be very, very tough without Malik Monk. He is just the heart and soul of this team. He's so important. I still have a lot of faith that the Kings can win this game. And then if they do, then, you know, it's a whole different ball game and we can look forward to the next game, whoever it's against. But right now, focused on this game, I have faith that the Kings can win. The games against the Warriors this season, three of them have been decided by one point. The series is Two and two, Warriors winning the first two. They won that one on the Clay Thompson game winner. Kings win the next two. Malik Monk had the game winner in the in-season tournament game. These teams just always seem to play it close. Even when the Kings were terrible and Kevin Durant was on the Warriors, I remember a season where the teams were separated by like, the Kings lost all four games. And I, it was like a five point or six point advantage for the Warriors total in four games. They just always seem to play close games. Here we are again in another meaningful game, another do or die game on Tuesday, 7 p.m. And I'm excited. I'm nervous, but I'm excited. So anyways, that is it for this episode of the Roll Report previewing the play-in game. Let me know your thoughts about this matchup. And I will see you guys after this game for hopefully it won't be the last time I'm recapping a game this season, but it is possible. So I'll see you guys then. Peace.